Excellent, excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, thanks for joining tonight. Um, this webinar that uh, is on a topic that is very close to my heart. Uh, and I would like to say uh, probably more relevant than ever, given the fact that uh, we uh, live in, uh, in a very dynamic time frame. Uh, the video that I showed at the opening of this webinar, uh, I had commissioned uh, two years ago, uh, basically to convey the same message. And that is that the world is changing fast. And in my view, we are at the end of the industrial age uh, as we have known it. Uh, and that means that um, we will have to see unprecedented change to address some of the key challenges that society is facing as a consequence of the phenomenal development that we have gone through. But little did I know when we made this video, because this was all before the COVID-19 outbreak. And I think uh, if anything has become clear ever since, is that um, the world is probably uh, in need of a change in leadership. Leadership that takes responsibility for addressing some of the key challenges society is facing. Um, and that is a topic that is intriguing me and that I would like to share with you some views on and hopefully have a discussion on in the context of this webinar. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I told you uh, in uh, the opening that uh, it is my strong conviction that we are at the end of the industrial age as we know it. Um, and the industrial revolution that started 200 years ago has created a tremendous amount of financial and economic wealth and that has already addressed uh, quite some challenges uh, in society. Many people have raised out of poverty, um, but it is also uh, undisputed that the growth that we have seen uh, has also resulted in big challenges um, of an eco ecological nature, of a social nature, uh, and probably also of an economic nature. Uh, one of the things that we have seen growing uh, is the global population. Um, I was born in 1967. And at that time, we had 3.4 billion people on the planet. So in my lifetime, the population on our planet uh, has doubled because today we are close to 8 billion people on the planet. The global population keeps growing. At the start of the industrial age, we had less than a billion inhabitants uh, of the planet. And the expectation is by 2050, we will have more than 10 billion people uh, living on planet Earth. That's only one of the things that have been growing uh, exponentially uh, over the last decades. Um, and the interesting thing is when you realize it, that that growth has probably been realized not always um, at, in conjunction and in harmony with all the stakeholders and inhabitants on the planet. But very often this growth uh, that we also see in economic terms uh, has been realized um, at the expense of all the resources. Uh, you see here some facts and figures and in the middle you see a cartoon that is pretty provoking and I, I do that on purpose because today we will be talking about responsible leadership and I will focus my presentation on corporate leadership, leadership in the business world. Um, we see that there is an enormous amount of wealth created in financial and economic terms over the last 200 years, uh, but it has resulted in quite some trouble. There's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than we have seen in any time in history. Uh, in 2018 alone, 120,000 square kilometers of tropical forest were lost. Deforestation is a big issue. Um, we see that average wildlife populations have been reduced by 60% uh, in just over 40 years. These are just some facts and figures uh, about the issues that we see in an ecological perspective in terms of climate. Um, and uh, I know that making the link directly uh, between um, business world, business community, the economy and the ecological uh, situation we are at uh, is a provocative one. But um, hopefully in the context of my presentation, I will be able uh, to answer some of the questions around this. I've seen that some of you are raising your hands. 
Um, I would like to propose uh, that I finish early and that we have uh, sufficient time for what will hopefully be a, a lively debate. So what we have seen, unprecedented economic growth. Growth is the buzzword. Um, growth in terms of the global population. Uh, growth in terms of economic wealth, but also big issues, big societal challenges. Uh, and the people sitting in the middle if those people represent the business world, I think the point that I would like to make is that the people in the middle need to become part of the solution. Uh, and that is, uh, for me, pretty much core to um, the notion of responsible leadership. If you talk about the challenges that society is facing, uh, and here you see a handful of those challenges, um, global warming, air pollution, access to clean water and energy, access to healthcare, poverty, inequality, but also pandemic diseases. Uh, when this slide was made, COVID was not even there. But what this picture shows is that the situation is complex and there are many, many interdependencies. And if the current COVID crisis shows one thing in my view, is that this interdependency is there, the complexity is there, but what we also see is that there are many underlying weaknesses, flaws uh, um, in the system. Flaws that in my view we need to address. And my hope is that the current COVID crisis is a wake up call for humanity uh, at large and more specifically for the business world uh, so that we can take ownership for the solutions, for addressing the issues that we see in the world around us in a responsible manner. Because the issues we see amongst others due to the outbreak of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic show locally, but only for a very short period of time. Before we know it, we see an impact that we have never seen before. And we are able to basically put society on hold. Uh, I hope you realize that neither the world wars uh, that we have experienced in recent times, nor the nuclear disasters in Fukushima, or the bomb on Hiroshima, uh, or any natural disaster has ever in our lifetimes been able to force humanity to really uh, slow down and, and basically make a sidestep. That is quite intriguing because there are challenges that arguably are as impactful or not, or even more impactful when it comes to the survival of the human race, like the climate crisis. Uh, that we have not been able to use as a, an energy source behind interventions uh, to, for instance, slow down air travel. What we have seen is that some of the challenges we see in the world around us are huge, and there is no one stakeholder uh, that can uh, remediate uh, those challenges. If, 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 if we learn from the COVID crisis a clear thing, over the last couple of months is, is that the state is back. The market is no longer um, the um, uh, regulating mechanism uh, for all of the issues that we face. But even states, governments, or multinational organizations or multilateral organizations cannot solve those issues without collaboration. Um, back in 2015, United Nations formulated the Sustainable Development Goals. And we can be happy to have those goals because, as a matter of fact, they constitute a kind of compass for the world, a kind of compass for humanity, if you want. Um, these, 15, these 17 goals uh, need to be realized by 2030 in order for humanity to prosper. Uh, and you can see them here on the screen. Um, they vary from fighting poverty, reducing inequality, uh, but also making sure that employment is decent, that there is sustainable economic growth, that there is access to healthcare and that we leave nobody behind when it comes to providing a good quality healthcare to the masses, but that there is also clean and affordable energy. So the sustainable development goals as formulated by the United Nations provide a very powerful compass for people in leadership positions to take their responsibility. Now, interestingly enough, and I made this point before, uh, business has a very big role to play. But we would be naive if we would assume that applying the same paradigms 
um, that broaders the issues that we are be currently being confronted with will also be the paradigms that help us to solve those issues. And when we come to, to the business world, we rely heavily on economic paradigms and economic notions. And one of those notions is value creation. The point that I want to make is that value creation uh, so far has been mainly defined on the short term by businesses and in economic terms, or more specifically in financial terms. When we talk about value creation, we predominantly talk about the creation of monetary value, financial value, and we try to do that as businesses on a relatively short term. One of the notions that need to be reconsidered is this notion of value creation, because in my view, value creation needs to be defined over multiple axes. And the business needs to be assessed not only based upon its ability to generate short-term return for its shareholders, but also to the extent that it contributes to the creation of ecological value and social value. And next to the value creation over multiple axes, I think it is important to also look at the time horizon. We measure currently businesses by their quarterly performance. And there has been quite some debate already that probably we need a longer time frame because if we want to address the big challenges of today um, and we want to make progress towards sustainable development goals, we need time and we should not only hold ourselves accountable for the progress that we make in a quarter. Um, so that is on the notion of value creation from, long ter from short term to long term, from, from a mono dimension basically economic value and financial value to multidimensional value creation, ecological and also social. But too much focus in my view has been put on growth as the leading doctrine. We keep growing. I've shown you the numbers of the global population that has been skyrocketing from less than a billion in 1750 when the industrial revolution started to 10 billion in 2030. Economic growth has been the mantra, uh, but during uh, recent speeches, I've made the point that if you look at nature, uh, many things that just keep growing, and especially if they keep growing in an uncontrolled fashion, turn malicious. So shouldn't we next to focusing on growth and value creation, also look at value distribution? Um, because arguably there is enough in terms of resources uh, to provide all people on the planet, even if the global population grows to 10 billion, a decent life. Um, if we want to really put up those concepts for discussion and we force business people, leaders in the business community and economists to really think differently about value creation and about value distribution, we need to go back to the notion of values. And in my view, and that's a very personal view, Many of the issues that we as a humanity are being confronted with and that we see in society as big wicked issues are also at the root a consequence of a crisis of values that we have. Now, let me give you a simple example. Um, the world billionaires have more wealth than the 4.6 billion people who make up 60% of the planet's population. And if those people would pay just half a percent of extra tax on their wealth over the next 10 years, we would be able to really address issues in childcare, in education and in health and create 117 million jobs in the process. These are numbers that were published by Oxfam Novib. What we often see though, is that business people and leaders in responsible positions use economic paradigms to justify the inequality that is there see it as a logical consequence of the fact that we have a capitalist system that focuses on shareholder value creation um, and as a consequence we end up in the situation that we are at but rather than finding justification for those inequalities and for those issues we probably should have the guts to put those very concepts up for debate and i know and this is a provocative statement 
but I make this statement on purpose because I would like to trigger you to have a meaningful debate uh, with each other, uh, with the people around you, and hopefully also with me uh, in the context of this webinar. This ain't right, no matter how you look at it. And the fact that we are currently seeing uh, that there is hundreds of billions of state money being invested in the public sector and in the private sector, whilst we know at the same time that the star companies of today, based upon their tax regimes, avoid paying taxes to the tune of approximately 500 billion. But that's an enormous amount of money that we as a, as a world and as a society desperately need to drive the transition that we want to see. So a strong plea on taking another look at value creation. Don't think about economic growth uh, as growth that can take place ad infinitum. Think about value distribution and think about value creation in a uh, multidimensional fashion. You would have expected probably these type of statements from politicians, from people working in, um, in non-governmental organizations, but not from somebody who currently is professor of practice at the School of Economics and Management, but who just closed off a a career of 30 years uh, at a big multinational being Royal Phillips, uh, the last nine years as member of the executive committee. Uh, the point that I want to make is that also in the corporate world, the thinking uh, about these type of concepts is really changing. We see more and more that a new concept for businesses is arising. And we take inspiration from the famous Harvard professor uh, Michael Porter, who has developed this notion of creation of shared value, where you meet societal needs, but you do that in such a way that it makes good business sense. And if it makes good business sense and it constitutes an opportunity, then you will mobilize an energy source, be it corporate enterprise, behind addressing those issues that is um, second to none. There is different thinking about these type of concepts in the business world. And, and some of you will know that many companies have been engaged in philanthropy, where you make donations to worthy courses and you engage in volunteering activities. And in the development of that practice, we moved on to corporate social responsibility, where there is more focus on compliance with ethical standards, community standards, good corporate citizenship, sustainability. Uh, but if I'm honest, much of uh, what happens under the umbrella of corporate social responsibility and philanthropy is basically for companies to mitigate risks, to ensure that they have uh, the license to operate and to manage and protect their reputations. It is in a certain way obligation driven. What if creating shared value, if mobilizing the company resources um, could be used also to create shared value and do that in a way that it safeguards the long-term survival of your company and your business and constitute new business opportunities. That is what is new in responsible leadership that embraces the notion of creating shared value. It is not only obligation driven, it is also because it constitutes a phenomenal opportunity. When you think about that continuum from charity to, let's say, uh, creating shared value, you also see that you have different players on that, on that continuum. On the left-hand side of this slide, you see the charities, the foundations, the non-governmental organizations that really put creating of societal value first. And at the right-hand side of this continuum, you see the traditional businesses as we all know them with their strong focus on creation of financial value, and I might add, on the short term. But you see, you see many new players arising along the continuum, trying to occupy the sweet spot of creating shared value. Social enterprises, purpose-driven businesses, impact ventures, sustainable businesses. And the essence of those new forms of entrepreneurship is that they embrace the process of developing but also implementing innovative and sustainable solutions that address the big challenges that society is facing today, but that are often neglected. And they do that at a for-profit 
uh, with a for-profit motive. This translates into social innovation. It's technical innovation, it's business model innovation, it's go-to-market innovation, it's marketing innovation. But the good th news is that if those social entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, because you increasingly also see them in big multinational corporations, if they succeed, you create traction vis-a-vis -vis the sustainable development goals. Let me give you a couple of examples. And I start with a very small startup company. Uh, it's called Interface. And they observed that many consumers bought carpet when they moved into an apartment or into a house. Uh, they buy the carpet and when they move out uh, or when they redecorate, the carpet is being taken out. It's being brought to waste and they buy new carpet. It's an enormous amount of waste that is generated in this business and they developed a new business model. They developed carpet as a service. So they provide comfort rather than selling carpets. They embrace the notion of, of cradle to cradle recycling, end to end recycling. And um, in the meantime, this small startup that started as an initiative of a couple of students has grown into an enterprise um, uh, of a billion uh, US dollar in sales. And in the meantime, they have also provided uh, 1,600 jobs uh, in, uh, in their company. A good example of a business innovation and business model innovation where you combine doing well with doing good. And this is a small startup that happened to be successful in scaling. But some of those smaller startups also team up with bigger companies like uh, Grameen and Danone. Um, Grameen is a very small enterprise uh, that uh, brings low cost fortified yogurt to malnourished children in Bangladesh. But they couldn't do that alone. So they, they teamed up with Danone and they happened to have a leader, uh, Frank Ribot, who said, well, for me, the goal of my company is bring health through food to as many people as possible. And if I do that well, my business will prosper as well. Uh, he teamed up with Grameen, uh, sourced the milk from local micro farmers, set up a distribution system of door-to-door -door delivery by local agents, local community workers, and they have established a franchise that has given access to nutritious food to hundreds of thousands of children in Bangladesh. And in the meantime, they have created thousands of jobs. So where the first example was a small startup, the second one is a small startup teaming up with a giant. But we also see that those giants are reinventing themselves. We don't have a lot of time to go too deep into Unilever, but I can assure you that Unilever, next to companies like DSM and also Philips, uh, that I will come to talk about, have really made a deliberate choice to align their strategies, their business models, and their policies to addressing those big wicked issues that society is facing. Not out of charity or corporate social responsibility motives alone, not only because of the obligation they feel as good corporate citizens, but also because of the opportunity it constitutes. And Unilever has, for instance, made a very strong commitment towards SDG3, which is about uh, water and sanitation for all people. I already referred to Philips, uh, and uh, that is the company that I worked for. And I would like to give you an example uh, on how Philips is trying to operationalize this notion of responsible leadership and acting with purpose. First of all, it formulated its main objective in non-financial terms. The highest goal that the company has publicly stated is to improve the lives of 3 billion people a year by providing good quality healthcare to the masses. It is not only looking at its shareholders. As a matter of fact, uh, business decisions are being taken by using this compass where you look at multiple stakeholders, starting with the underserved, customers, but also the environment and our, and our employees. And we don't only look at the positive effects of our decisions, but we take the cost of our decisions into account as well when we make, when we make business decisions. You see that here in this pie chart in the green areas, which are the benefits, but also the red areas that are the cost. It is, um, in my view, 
quite unresponsible for big corporations, for instance, to not pay a price for, for instance, the CO2 emissions they are accountable for. It's a price of doing business, but it is a cost for society and not for the shareholders. Many companies, I can assure you, not only the small ones, not only the social enterprises, but also the big corporates like Philips, like Unilever, like DSM, are changing in this direction. What is really different now? Because weren't companies also responsible citizens in the past and uh, weren't they socially engaged? Yes, for sure. But as said, mainly out of an obligation-driven motive and perspective, mainly because they felt that it constituted their license to operate and being part of society made them almost um, go in the direction of also taking care of society at large. But the new notion is that innovating your business, reinventing yourself, reinventing the concepts, the economic concept be, be, uh, below value creation or beyond value creation constitutes a business opportunity that is phenomenal. And this report was issued in 2018 by uh, the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, which is a group led by 35 CEOs and civil society uh, leaders. And they said that if businesses go in this direction where they align their strategies more with the sustainable development goals and they innovate the way they think about value creation, there is a 12 trillion opportunity. And there is an opportunity to create hundreds of millions of new jobs. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is also a notion that gives me hope because if business people and if economists see an opportunity to prosper and secure the long-term survival of their companies in a world that is changing that rapidly, as evidenced by the movie that we showed before the presentation, then there is hope that we can tap into the phenomenal amount of resources and capabilities that those businesses have. But it requires responsible leaders, leaders that really take their responsibility seriously. So the key messages that, that I've been trying to convey uh, in my short presentation is that in my view, we are uh, um, coming to the end of the industrial age as we know it. Uh, and we see that an enormous amount of economic uh, financial wealth has been accumulated over the last 200 years since the industrial revolution. But we also see that there are big, complex, interdependent problems of an economic nature, of a social nature, of an ecological nature that have been arised. And they might become irreversible if we continue to apply the same concepts and theories that arguably might have contributed to those problems in the first place. I think that the COVID crisis is a wake-up call in that sense, because it really clearly shows the underlying vulnerabilities, dependencies and weaknesses in society. Um, and in my view, the positive power of COVID could be that it could act as a catalyst or an accelerator to the transition that we need to a new era. But we need responsible leaders in the public sector and in the private sector that don't only look at short-term financial value creation, but also long-term ecological and social value creation. That don't only look at growth as a goal in itself, but also in the distribution of wealth uh, and value. And therewith, um, make the society a bit more fair. Because if you want it to be fair, you need to share. Now the good news is that this is not only something that people in business and leaders need to do because somebody tells them to or that they are being forced because of uh, uh, situations that we are experiencing in recent times like a health pandemic. It's also an opportunity. It's also an opportunity if you innovate your business model and you take the responsibility for the innovation of your business model, applying those new concepts, uh, you have a phenomenal opportunity uh, to develop sustainable business that benefits a multitude of stakeholders. And therewith, I believe, you have the best guarantees for, for ensuring the long-term competitive uh, staying power of your company in a world that is changing fast. And if that is not good enough, then I would like to close off with a quote from Albert Einstein, who said, those who have the privilege to know also have the duty to act. And I think, if anything, we should be more aware that this is the time to act. With that, I would like to close off my presentation and open it up for any questions that you might have.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronald, uh, for a very inspiring and challenging presentation, I would say. Um, many questions are coming in at the moment, so uh, uh, you have challenged uh, us at this point. And so let me first start with the first question that already came in after about 20 minutes by Dirk Jan. So Dirk Jan, I'm going to ask you, are you, are you Dirk, can you maybe pose your question yourself? Dirk Jan, can you unmute? Yes, I was on Thanks. mute. Apologies, yes. Go ahead, Wait. welcome. Thank you for the inspiring presentation. Uh, you already referred to him afterwards, uh, to Paul Polman. I just finished his book and I was happy to hear many of those aspects are echoed in your presentation. Uh, um, he's a good practice, I think, in a global company like Unilever, but is, uh, is he a role model now, as you can see, in, in, as a big comp a global co CEO, or did he really miss some crucial elements in his leadership? Um, I know Paul Pullman very well, and he's been a, a source of inspiration for me as well. I think, uh, and I also read the book uh, with a lot of interest. Um, you know, what I think is that um, if you want to change something that has been persistent uh, for decades, um, then um, you will be at first um, the one that is uh, shouting in the desert, as they say in the Netherlands, the roepen in the woestijn. Um, and you will be faced with a lot of opposition and people will say that you are uh, foolish, that you don't get it, that this is not the way it works. Um, and then you need to deal with that opposition. Uh, and I think that in a sense, people like Paul Polman, not only Paul Polman, also people like Feike Siebesma, uh, the former CEO of DSM, who's currently doing a stellar job uh, as the COVID, uh, COVID um, envoy uh, for the Dutch government. They are paving the path. I would say, for more corporate leaders and business leaders uh, to follow their suit. Um, I don't think that I'm in a position to comment on the specific personal leadership style of Paul Polman. I know that he is very passionate about this and he is also very determined to change things. Uh, as a matter of fact, since he retired, he is dedicating uh, his entire time and a big chunk of his fortune uh, to, drive, uh, to drive this system change in the business world. Thank you, Ronald. Thank you, Um A second question is coming from our colleague, Frederik Knuts. Frederik, are you online still? You might be on mute, Frederik. Sorry, I would hope that I finally have found the mute button by now. <laughs> Keep struggling with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I don't know. Um, it seems to me that uh, a lot of companies undertake this shift from going to from a shareholder value to a stakeholder value approach. Um, uh, by, by, from the fact that there's a burning platform, really. For example, Unilever with the whole the tea thing, they, they realized at some point if they continued like that, there would be no more uh, earth, really, to, uh, to grow their tea. And that's what started the whole process. So do you think that it's, it's things like that, the real burning platform, or is it like intrinsically motivated new generation that's coming in? What's your view on that? This is a great question, Frederik, and I think uh, there is not one answer to it. Uh, party is a burning platform, but let's be honest. Um, uh, we have seen, and I saw a chat popping up about how many wake-up calls do we need. I mean, how many times did we hear about air pollution? I mean, more people died in the last three months from air pollution uh, than uh, people dying from COVID. Uh, and we know that, for instance, the airline industry and, and a big industry is contributing to that. But we have never been able to make an intervention to slow that down. As a matter of fact, uh, relying upon the market uh, as a regulating mechanism using the old economic doctrines, we have seen that ticket prices have been dropping. Uh, and despite the fact that we need to get away from the fossil industry, the IMF, is subsidizing the fossil industry with five trillion US dollars a year. So point being, there is not only a burning, a burning platform has been there. I think now it is more acute due to COVID, um, but it is also the opportunity that people see, arguably, and that is a point that I've been trying to make. And to a certain extent, it, it is generational. My own personal uh, uh, view though, uh, is another provo provocative statement probably, is that we also should not overestimate that. 
Uh, I think that um, very often the way we talk about millennials and generation X, Y, and Z uh, is, is as if they are a different species. And uh, if I go back um, in my own, let's say, life, uh, I see also many similarities between what people are after uh, today versus what we were after 30, 40 years ago. So it might be partly generational. Uh, it is partly the burning platform. Uh, we are with, the, with our back against the walls. It's also partly the opportunity that, uh, that, uh, that people see uh, and that business leaders are feeling attracted to. So maybe finally, sort of perfect storm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Frederic. So we've got another question here from T. Reukers. Reukers, um, are you still on board? Yes, I'm definitely still on board. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Hi, Hon. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's uh, Tom Reukers, but uh, ah, Tom. I can ah, see, okay. yes. So, uh, no, I, I, I commented uh, and, and posed the question at the same time. So, uh, I commented that I believe in general that it's a good start for organizations to embrace, as Ronald also showed, the uh, uh, sustainability development uh, goals. Um, but at the same time, I have a question on that. Uh, is there data available demonstrating that companies who have embraced those goals, that they perform better on stakeholder value and perhaps shareholder value compared to companies uh, who, who didn't uh, embrace those goals? The short answer is yes. Um, uh, but, but there is a question that is underlying the question. That is, if you say, do they perform better? Then my, my challenge to you would be define perform. Um, because one of the things that I see, and I've been trying to elucidate that based upon that purpose compass that I showed, is that also management accounting will be changing quite drastically over the next couple of years. As a matter of fact, at Tilburg University, uh, we are doing some work on that with Bart Diering, uh, also from the School of Economics but in the, in the accounting department, where you see that the, the performance of a business is being evaluated uh, not only by looking at the P&L on the balance sheet, uh, but at other factors as well. So my feeling is that we will see more and more of that. Um, what I also see is that many uh, shareholders and big investors, uh, institutional investors, but also financial analysts, are, as a matter of fact, putting pressure on corporations to start reporting their performance in a multi-dimensional fashion, which I think is a good thing. Um, you might have read uh, the, the, the letter that Larry Fink, the head of uh, BlackRock, which is one of the biggest, uh, let's say, asset um, management companies in the world, uh, sends to um, uh, CEOs of the companies he invests in or his company invests in, where he basically actively calls upon them to embrace the, the stakeholder model rather than the shareholder model. I mean, this goes back to the fact that the Anglo-American model, the neoliberal model, is sli slow, sh slow, slowly but surely uh, making place for a, a revival of the Rhineland model uh, that, we, uh, that we used to have in, the, uh, uh, in, 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 in Europe uh, in um, uh, the early days. So we will see more and more of that. We need to redefine the performance. But there is, there, is a, um, uh, there is evidence, there is data as well. Uh, and I can share that um, via the organizing committee separately, uh, that as a matter of fact, those companies perform better as well. A long answer to a uh, complex question. Thank okay, you. Thank is that you. okay for you, uh, Tom? Yeah, well, there's many questions coming in, uh, Ronald. So uh, there's uh, about uh, yeah, 10 minutes left. So. I'm going to ask quickly to Yolanda uh, Berkhoff. Uh, you also posed the question. Are you still online? Yes, you? fine. Yeah. Okay, welcome, Yolanda. Yeah, my Go question ahead. is about uh, the era you refer to as the, um, uh, the end of the industrial era. What eras are, uh, are, are next ahead of us? Uh, Personally, I believe the information era, but we are, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, Yolanda, what you see is that uh, the, 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 the way this is being talked about very often is that um, uh, we are entering the, for we are basically in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, where the first one was the steam engine, and the second one was the mass production, uh, so the industrialization, uh, the mass production and consumption of goods. The third one was the computer era, and the fourth uh, industrial revolution is one where a lot of things come together. Uh, um, uh, bioengineering, uh, big data, uh, smart algorithms, um, digitization in the broader sense, uh, nano uh, technology, uh, and all of and, and, and the revolutions we see in healthcare technology, the genomics, all of that coming together uh, at, at the same point in time. Um, so that is what is being referred to as the fourth industrial revolution, a society that is incredibly complex but also offers a lot of opportunity to address those wicked issues. In my view, only if we abandon some of the old paradigms in thinking about how you run a corporation as a leader. Um, and that's the point that I've been trying to make. Uh, a lot of things coming together at the same time. It's a kind of perfect storm. All right. Is that okay to you, Lambda? Yeah, okay. All right, thanks. Well, then we have Freik Peters uh, with last question. Freik, are you still online? Yeah, I'm still online. Hello, Ronald. Uh, thank hey, you Freik. for an interesting uh, speech. You're painting, uh, giving a hopeful perspective. We're slowly but surely uh, uh, to a certain direction. But if you if you look at the challenges uh, you, you you picture at the at the beginning of your uh, of your uh, speech about uh, tw 2050. Is a question you can propose is it isn't it too little too late do we have an alternative i mean <laughs> my, my my point is if if we this is almost a bit of a philosophical uh, debate um, but uh, i i think that um, we we need to have the guts to abandon those old paradigms uh, and um I don't know whether it's too little or too late. I also have strong belief in the resilience of people, uh, in their uh, ingenuity, uh, in, um, the re in, the, in, the, in the persistence uh, to achieve goals. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think that this, this, this COVID crisis uh, that we are all um, seeing is also giving me hope in, in the strangest sh shapes and forms. Despite the, the fact that people are uh, working remotely, there seems to be more community sense. Um, I, t as recently as today, we get signals that there might be a medicine. Uh, it's the famous Oxford uh, medicine and the test results are hopeful. Uh, I mean, we talk about a couple of months that we are able to make those statements where normally uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, you talk about years. Yes. Um, so um, is it too little too late? I hope not. Uh, because, uh, as some people say, there is no planet B. Uh, so, uh, but, but we will need to see sustainable behavioral change. And we need leaders to initiate that change and role model that change uh, and go as fast as they, as they humanly can. Um, and I hope it's not too late, Frank. Thank you, Ronald. Thanks, Frank. And uh, so when it comes to leadership, there's a question of Patricia van Amen. Patricia, are you still there? Can you please unmute? Yes. <laughs> ah, thanks. Uh, Welcome, Patricia. Thank you, and thanks for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and my uh, question is about the um, uh, the leadership, which in in this uh, presentation you focus on the leadership at a strategic level, uh, and I'm interested in what your personal view is on. Uh, the way we can spread these ideas throughout the whole organizations. Yeah. Well, I, uh, that, that's, I mean, I realize uh, that when I have 30 minutes to make a pitch on a complex topic, um, that, that you cannot do justice to, let's say, the notion of leadership in, in its broader sense. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm trying to set up a new course at Tilburg University on responsible leadership. and. 
um, uh, that will be multiple, uh, let's say, uh, uh, classes and lectures over a longer period of time where we go into all those, uh, into all those elements. Uh, I think uh, it, it starts with leadership. I, I think uh, that, is, that is for sure. Uh, leadership uh, behavior very often of, of people in a responsible position gets copied. Um, the good behavior, the bad behavior, also the ugly behavior. Uh, so leadership in that sense is important. Value-based leadership is important. Um, leaders that, that have the courage and the guts to challenge uh, existing paradigms uh, and, and face the adversity and opposition, that is important. And how does that percolate into the organization? Um, uh, if, if you look at companies like Unilever, uh, DSM, uh, but also um, uh, Philips, uh, you, you will see that as a matter of fact, one of the main reasons that people uh, want to work for those companies and stay there is, is the purpose is the fact that those companies try to do the right thing, uh, are aware of the fact that they might have adverse effects based upon the decision they take, uh, but they, they put that on the table and try to mitigate that. I think that is increasingly probably something generational where um, uh, being purposeful and responsible uh, is a, a magnet for talent. And, and talent will, at the end of the day, define the success of your organization. Uh, so I see that um, leaders have a, have a key role to play there uh, and that we talked tonight about, about corporate leaders. Uh, I saw a, a pop-up of a chat uh, where uh, my opinion was asked about some of the political leaders we have in the world around us today. Um, uh, I don't want to go too deep into politics, but I see by co uh, comparing and contrasting, uh, people will eventually do the right thing. That is my hope. Uh, we, we could also um, uh, assume that they will do the wrong thing, um, uh, but, uh, but that is a very doom and gloom perspective. So leaders have a very important role and, and their, their, geno the, their genuineness, their authenticity uh, is, is very easily recognized and it's very easily followed. If it's not genuine or not authentic, uh, it, 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 it fires back tremendously and there are also examples of that, but that's for one of those lectures that is in the making. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Patricia. So, uh, Ronald, you already referred to uh, uh, to what, some of the political leaders, and Leonard de Jong uh, asked a question about uh, Donald Trump. But I think you dealt already a little bit with that question of Leonard. Uh, Leonard, can we go on to the next uh, person that asked a question? Is that okay to you? Because I think that uh, Ronald already answered some of it. Yes, that's good. that's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, thanks Elena. All right, so then I go to Brent. Brent, Derf. Uh, Brent, are you still online? Yes, I'm still here. Hello, everyone. Uh, hi, Brent. Welcome. Hello, Ronald. Um, hi. Well, hey, my question is about uh, the aspect of value creation. In both cases, uh, shared value and traditional value creation depends on demand from the market. And so it would be possible for an organization to operate 50-50, let's say 50-50, maybe 30-70, in the old and new way of value creation. Because some people want still cheap products and other ones want more um, products that are um, made responsible, for instance. Should we, my question is, should we not be looking at the cost side or the supply side of this whole uh, question? And by starting internalizing costs and making companies really accountable for, uh, for, for the true cost of business, so to say. Yeah, uh, the, the, the simple answer to that question is that I wholeheartedly agree. So that's one of the paradigm shifts that we need to make. Uh, and uh, I, I, I realize that I've not been uh, clear, but that is what you do in that purpose compass, uh, where you add the cost of doing business. Whether it ends up in your PL or not, I mean, is a matter of time. But if you use it as a factor to make, to base your decisions upon, you come to different outcomes. Uh, and I am pretty much convinced that over time, laws, regulations, but also uh, demands from the financial world uh, um, uh, will result in a different way of taking those factors into account that so far have been um, considered exter externalities. I mean, the, the point, this is the very essence. Eh? Uh, uh, my my uh, statement would be, 
uh, and, and again, a bit black and white, but that the, the wealth accumulated over the last 200 years was very often at the expense of resources, natural resources, uh, ecological resources, uh, also human resources, and not in harmony with those resources. Now, if you want to balance that out, I mean, what gets measured gets done. So you need to make sure that you price that in. I'm, I'm very much in favor of that, Brent. Okay, okay. Maybe if I can ask one follow-up question. And I'm looking Finally. at Geert Jan, he is the boss today. Yeah, you know, we got uh, three minutes left, so that, that's going to be the final question. And uh, before you pose that question, I think, uh, Ronald, would you be available or would you be open to answering questions by email? Because there's about seven additional questions. Uh, how would you like to go about that? Yeah, no, that, that is fine. Uh, so maybe we can agree that uh, uh, Renske sends me those questions. Yes. I answer them. Uh, seven is fine. Uh, uh, Fifteen <laughs> is also not an issue. Uh, Seventy would be a bit too much, I, ge I yeah. guess, to digest. But uh, okay. for sure, I will do my best to answer them all in uh, in a short period of time. Okay, Brent. So uh, go ahead with the final question of tonight. All right. Thank you. Um, so the, the question is: Who would be responsible for setting the standards? Would it be the market in uh, the government with government agencies, maybe uh, on a continental level, or a combination of them, and why? Yeah, um, I, I think you will see a mixed uh, model. Uh, in, in some cases, the biggest um, and the most powerful form of regulation is self-regulation. But then again, um, and that, is, that is also not always happening. Uh, so I think that we, I, I, I literally said the state is back. That is what we have seen uh, in the COVID crisis. And not only from, let's say, a neg with a negative connotation, but also with a, I think, a positive connotation. So the state will have a role to play, uh, but all the stakeholders as well. And, and the very essence, I think, of leadership uh, in, in, in the new world uh, is, is this collaboration. Um, this collaboration between uh, various uh, people that, at the end of the day, make up society. Um, so... It will be a combination where self-regulation is proven to be powerful and there where um, uh, the government needs to help to get that going and provide guidance uh, that is very much needed as well. All right, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Ronald, because we're coming, yeah, it is uh, 8.29, so we promise to keep this one hour. Uh, let's stay one hour. So, um, like uh, like I just proposed, if you would have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Ronald. You will find Ronald's email address on the present presentation that will be sent to you tomorrow by our alumni relations uh, department. Um, and that's one thing. Uh, I was going to ask you one more question, Ronald, but you're not going to be able to pose it tonight, but we'll talk about it later, because I was just wondering, what is the role of academia, of our university, or universities in this respect? But you don't have to answer that tonight. Well, um, but, you, but, but uh, 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 this is like giving me the opportunity to make <laughs> a statement that I've been wanting to make for a long time. Go ahead. Um, a, a lot of it, uh, of the thinking will have to be substantiated uh, and uh, it will have to be, let's say, um, be rooted in research uh, and new models will have to be concipiated. So um, my, and that is why I want to embrace this at Tilburg University as a, as a new, let's say, uh, theme. Because Tilburg is very strong in economics, we know that. It's very strong in humanities as well. Uh, and and uh, it, it is uh, for me a bit frustrating as a professor at this university to see that many other universities uh, are really very active in this field, um, developing new concepts, testing new concepts, doing a lot of research. Uh, and um, uh, I think there is uh, a lot done in Tilburg, uh, but it is very compartmentalized. And I think we need to bring it together. Uh, and, and I want to, let's say, invest my energy uh, in doing just that. Thank you very much. So, dear dear alumni, uh, before closing the session, I'm going to ask you to just stay a little while online because we're going to end with a short video of Frederik Knut, who posed one of the first questions tonight, uh, our director of alumni relations. Uh, but after the presentation uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, of uh, the short video, 
then uh, the session will be closed. So let me wish you a very nice evening. Thanks again, Ronald, for your very inspiring presentation. Um, hope to see you next week again. Bye-bye now. Good evening. I really hope you enjoyed today's content, today's webinar. It was offered to you by TIAS School for Business and Society in cooperation with the professional learning program of Tilburg University. And I hope it was uh, exciting and that you learned something. And that's what we are as a university. We're supposed to learn you something and inspire you. And my name is Frederik Knut. Uh, I just wanted to tell you uh, a little bit about our students. I'm director of alumni relations. I'm also director of the Tilburg University Fund. And uh, uh, there is something that's concerning me and uh, I wanted to share that concern with you. A lot of our students, especially the international students, are having a really hard time. Uh, many of them lost their jobs in, in, in bars and, and restaurants and have, uh, so they have no access to funds. Many of them uh, have lost the support of their parents because the parents became unemployed. So they struggle financially and, and we all know if you struggle financially, it's really hard to concentrate on your studies. And uh, that's why the Tilburg University Fund has decided to allocate funds to help these students. And today I would like to ask you for your support. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar today, I'm really hoping that you would like to, sh to show your appreciation by donating to the fund to help our students. Uh, we'll be taking the liberty to send you a SMS, uh, a ticky, uh, with a request for a donation. And uh, obviously, if you don't like this, please delete it, no obligations. But if you share your my concern for our students, then please consider donating. And uh, that would not only make me very happy, but obviously it would really help our students and make them happy and make them able to concentrate on studies and uh, finish this year successfully. Um, thank you so much. Uh, hope to see you again next webinar and uh, have a nice evening.